Thank you for coming this morning. I welcome a chance to talk with you. Uh, I feel like I've been set up here that now I'm gonna save the, save the planet. I always come away from these meetings feeling nervous about, oh, all these threats that are, right? Um, so I wanna give a brief, part of my charge today was to talk about what we mean by One Health. And um, as I've talked with people throughout uh, my discussions here today, one thing that we can all agree on is this is an amorphous definition, right? There's an a, amorphous concept that we all use when we think about this concept of One Health. Uh, our focus and my focus as a researcher has been on, first of all, conceptually, conceptualizing this idea and thinking about the role of social science in One Health questions. There's a couple key components to this idea of One Health that have been raised here, I think, and many of you have thought more about this than I, but the essence of that definition is this notion of interdependency between human, animal, and ecological health. Um, and it's that interdependency that is where the, where the key is or the sort of sweet spot between those three uh, forms of health. My thinking about this issue has really been focused on these complex interdisciplinary integrated challenges and identifying when approaching something from a One Health perspective is a value-added proposition, right? So I've spoke with a number of you, and some of you have said, there are cases where I don't think that the One Health approach is what, how I would approach a question, right? And certainly there are many things that we do in our work where we don't approach uh, things from this One Health sort of uh, integrated, interdisciplinary perspective. Um, but the question is, is when is value added by approaching from this integrated way? Uh, our group at Michigan State has been funded by the National Cancer Institute since we started it, this work in the year 2000. I was looking back over things and I was like, 2000, that feels like 100 years ago. Um, it, it, it is in, in many ways, right? Um, and we really started looking at uh, what is the role for social science research in One Health questions. We brought together a team of researchers from across human health, animal health, ecological health, as well as people from across social science disciplines. So I represent in my own work a small piece of that in communication science, but we brought together together, sociologists, economists, uh, anthropologists, et cetera, to talk about, along with human health and animal health and ecological health experts, where are the key research questions for social researchers in this One Health space, and how do those questions contribute to this broader concept of One Health, and where the key research questions are in that space as well. We, as a result of these meetings, wrote a paper that really tried to lay out a broad set of issues or questions that address recommendations, and this I felt kind of um, uh, uh, like I was overstepping my bounds in many ways, trying to say, where, where does social science fit into One Health, as I'm not, uh, I can't speak for all of social science, but part of what we were trying to do as a group was um, identify some broad issues where we see there's value both for um, social scientists, but also for people interested in solving complex integrated challenges, such as the issues that you are speaking about today. My collaborators on this, um, Dr. Julie Funk is a, uh, a veterinary epidemiologist with whom I've worked for a number of years on, on projects, project proposals on a variety of topical areas, and then um, a student of ours who worked with us on this work. So let me just launch, my purpose is really to talk about some of these broad issues and some of the key questions we see um, underneath each of these broad issues. The first broad issue is this idea that as social researchers, as, um, as engaged people who are engaged in One Health work, one of the key issues that we need to understand is how humans contextualize their own health within this broader um, system of human, animal, and ecological health, and whether or not identifying those connections for people is a value-added question or not, and when it's a value-added question. Okay, so this may be more specific question. That's a very broad idea, right? But it, it comes from this place of understanding, starting with communities and understanding communities as the first step in understanding communication patterns, social patterns, et cetera. So to try and narrow this a little bit, it may be asking questions like, where are the decisions that have the most impact across um, One Health? So where are the, if we consider human decision making as fundamental in many One Health questions, where are these decisions? How are those decisions made? Okay. 
Um, the second sort of question under this realm is what are what one health issues are most critical for communities? So as a researcher as someone who engages in community-based research my starting point is always Understanding the community in which I'm working and understanding where they see their their needs Okay, sometimes it's disappointing because the needs that they see are needs that maybe the human health or animal health community doesn't sees as irrelevant, okay? But identifying what those needs are is a, is a key um, sort of first question. The last point here is where are the points of intervention? And I use that word carefully. In communication research, we have a, a meaning around that that, that it, uh, deals with, in some cases, strategic-based communication activities, in some cases, um, uh, facilitating decision making, et cetera. I know for you the word intervention may have a different meaning. And so I use that word to mean where is there a place where there's a need for intervention? Is there a place where people are um, uh, having pr problems making good decisions around something? Is there a place where there's going to be a lot of uh, what we would call bang for your buck in terms of intervention, okay? And I give an example of this as uh, we've done a lot of work on hand washing. So part of what I've done as a social researcher is try and identify where are the health behaviors that are most meaningful and potentially impactful in terms of health-related outcomes or ecological-related outcomes, et cetera? One of those, as many of you know, is simply hand-washing, right? It's also a behavior that, as a social scientist, is interesting to study because of the fact that you can observe those patterns, right? There are many health behaviors in which we engage that are unobservable for a variety of reasons, but hand washing is one of those behaviors that is easy to observe, can be modified through um, practice, et cetera, through education, through communication activities. So it's interesting to watch um, this as a social scientist. In some cases, this is an important place for intervention. So we've done work, for example, on building models, building agent-based models to understand if you promote hand washing among different sectors within, let's just take a real concrete example, like a child care center, where is the place to intervene? Where is the place to promote better hand washing? Okay, what would we guess? We're gonna make this interactive, how about that? Where would we guess? Who needs to wash their hands in a child care setting? When they toilet, okay, who are the people? What kinds of people in a child care setting? The kids? The teachers, okay? So yes, what we see from agent-based modeling is that teachers are the, the intervention point. If you want to intervene in a child care center, we've done microbial swab analysis. Often surfaces are very clean, right? So it's not cleaning the surfaces. We've watched food preparation practices. We've modeled what happens when you intervene at various points in a child care center. And the answer is if you can get child care workers to wash their hands, better under when they have the right the appropriate opportunities to do that and improving that quality of hand washing but of course child care workers believe that they're very good hand washers right so tackling that problem and addressing that problem is a is a key uh, social question I give an example, and this is from, not from my own work, but from the literature of um, thinking about this notion of where the intervention points are. And this is one mapping, one way to look at um, an uh, infectious disease and where the human decision points are and where the points of intervention might be from a social standpoint. Okay? Another example of this is what we call um, influence mapping or mental models maps, where you map social connections between things, where you map how people think about issues and who influences them and where the decisions are made that ultimately um, impact uh, action and outcomes. The second big issue that I want to just cover briefly is understanding the nature of information and communication and how what people need in terms of their One Health decision, then ultimately how that influences their decision making and behaviors. And I'm going to give you just a couple brief examples of the, these types of questions. One is this idea of what are the characteristics of One Health innovations or interventions and how do they in, diffuse through populations, okay? So many of you are working within communities or um, with particular groups of people. How do innovations and, and interventions that are, occur in that setting move beyond that system? Things that work really well, how do they move beyond that system? Um, what role does information from our social system play in behavioral decisions? And this is really where my research is focused, trying to understand how people around us influence our actions and, and the things that we do each day. 
How do cultural dynamics and social evolution play a, a um, key role in One Health decisions? And I'm going to give you a couple of key examples of, of these big questions. We've recently begun working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the United States to try and understand this question of when you have strong tested interventions in low resource communities, how do you move those from those communities into other low resource settings? What are the characteristics of those innovations that diffuse, help them diffuse through social systems? Now, these are questions about the nature of those interventions. These are questions about the nature of the social system, right? And so these are these, and these are also questions about the nature of the threat or the risk that is being addressed by these, these interventions. A second broad example of this is some work we've been doing on understanding the role of financial incentives and social norms in what are called payment for ecosystem services programs. Um, these are programs where people are paid essentially to engage in conservation behaviors to con uh, conserve scarce resources. They're also used broadly in One Health to promote vaccination in some cases. We've looked at this in the context of, e of um, ecosystem services support within uh, watersheds. And so we've been trying to understand how do social dynamics, social norms in this case, influence um, decisions and how does that feed into human, animal, and ecological health change. This is a picture of the area in which we're doing this work on the Tibetan Plateau in, in uh, Western China. The final issue is uh, identifying the key characteristics of new and emerging communication technologies, how and when they're useful for information seeking and sharing about One Health issues. The broad questions here are things like, how do people use communication technology to make their decisions? We can't talk about communication in this day and age. We can't talk about pandemic threats. We can't talk about any of these issues without recognizing the key role that some of you are sitting on your phone right now looking at, <laughs> looking at, no offense, it's looking at communication, uh, looking at information and making decisions about something um, uh, in the context of this meeting. How do online networks influence our decision? So this gets to that social ne network question. Um, how is data harvesting, mining, and taming useful for outbreak identification? And um, some of you will be speaking about this issue when we break out into the big data section. And then another sort of key question here is how do we take the kinds of data that is being presented here and turn that into a format that's useful for people as they make their decisions about their health or decisions about um, where intervention points may be? Health map is an example of this. Um, we've used, for example, user-generated content through social media to promote hand washing. Um, and this is an example of using uh, information networks, identifying information flow networks around antimicrobial resistance-based policies um, and, the, and decisions about antibiotic use among veterinarians. So how do we do this? And um, of course, this is a big question, and many of this will be a discussion that we continue to have, but there, I think, are some key things to think about here. One is there's models for interdisciplinary. Ultimately, this is a matter of interdisciplinary collaboration, right? And so there's models for this all over the world. And certainly, I know in, in the US, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health have invested millions of dollars on understanding how to facilitate these large-scale interconnected research teams and outreach groups who are trying to do um, One Health-based sorts of questions and embed social science into those, um, into those questions. So um, there's models out there for how to do this. And certainly, I've worked on these kinds of projects, and many of you have. So understanding those models and the characteristics of those models and replicating those models. Ultimately, it comes down to a matter of relationships, right? So we, what, what we've discovered or what we, what we know is we like to work with people with whom we, we like to work with people we like, right? So people like to work with people with whom they have a relationship, and that's part of what fosters this interdisciplinary um, complex teams uh, working so well together. These types of meetings are an example of how to foster this kind of thing. It takes a significant time investment to be able to do this sort of interdisciplinary collaboration and build the relationships that it takes to make these things successful. And that's a matter of having the luxury to be able to do that and having the opportunities to be able to connect in, to, to do this sort of work. And then finally, it takes institutional support for this. Certainly, we know that um, to the extent that there's financial support for this, but also to the extent that people are rewarded within their organization for engaging in cross-sector collaboration, that will support this kind of work. 
With that, I acknowledge my collaborators and funders of this work, and I leave you with a moment of zen here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <Thank you. laughs> Thank you very much. How, uh, how would you say that this explosion of social media and mobile phones helps the issue of One Health? Are there any concrete examples of this? Well, it certainly has made it easier to understand. So one key thing that some members of our team work on is the notion of mining, for example, Twitter feeds and other forms of social media to identify um, emerging issues, emerging risks, et cetera, right? So there is this broad scale platform now to see social interaction happening to the extent that people are able to access those platforms, right? It also allows for um, a diverse set of social support networks for people. Um, it started, you know, back in, a I worked in HIV prevention when I started out as a, as a young person many years ago. Um, and that's, at that point we started with social support networks online. And those became a very powerful tool for people who did not want to engage with the traditional networks within HIV prevention organizations, et cetera. So the technology brings what we call affordances. That is, it brings, it, it, the communication technology that's out there has characteristics that can help and sometimes hinder um, our efforts as uh, communicators. Mm. And, and how, how common or, or how interested or aware or one half do you think social scientists are today? Is this a big issue among you? Or is it a, I'm or pretty, is it I'm you? I'm pretty sure nobody read that paper that I wrote that I showed you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I, I see more traffic about this issue. I know that we have a big group of people that are engaged. I think there are a lot of people working on zoonotic disease and I emerging infectious disease who maybe don't identify themselves as One Health. So the label of One Health within um, many social science disciplines is unfamiliar. When I present, like when I presented this paper at conferences, people were like. What exactly is that, yeah. right? So, um, so the label is unfamiliar, but the actual engagement in interdisciplinary teams is very common. Many of you are working with social scientists in the work that you do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any short comments or questions? Yes, in the back we have one there. And if you can introduce yourself briefly. Hi, my name's Aaron Zink. I'm from Uppsala University in CEDA. Uh, here in Sweden. Uh, you mentioned that uh, sometimes when you're talking to the communities, sometimes their needs are ones that the researchers, whether it's animal or health sciences, don't really, uh, don't see as important or relevant needs or interests. And I wonder, in that, in that case, is the role of the social scientist, is it to convince the researchers that these are important and find a way to integrate them, or is it to educate and change the ideas of the, the community that you're working with? Would or both. It, it's it's often it's often easier <laughs> it's often easier to persuade a research team than it is to persuade a whole community that this is an important issue, right? So, so our work very much starts from this idea of um, people have competing priorities around health risk, around environmental risks, etc. Identifying what's important to communities is where we need to start our work. What, that doesn't mean that the things that we're talking about here today aren't important, but understanding what's important for communities, I believe, is, is where we need to start. Um, what that means practically is you may start out, I've started out research projects where we thought, we're going in this direction, right? And then as you move through understanding the community, we, you see, no, this, that, this doesn't make any sense at this point, right? So, so it requires flexibility, cognitive flexibility on the part of a research team and on the part of a funder if, uh, uh, to be open to this idea that if you are truly engaging with communities and identifying where their needs are around an issue, then there needs to be the flexibility to change course if it appears that um, where you originally intended to go with your efforts um, doesn't make sense for this particular group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Yeah.